We are back on the overhead cam and you can see I've got my G80 here. I, I really want to put one of these in a cage, but as you saw in my last video, my other G80 is dead. Panasonic has gotten back to me and they're picking this one up tomorrow or yesterday, depending on when you watch this video, but I still want to put one in a cage. I, well, I can't do that one. So I did the only logical thing that any sane and rational person would do. I, I bought another one. <laughs> so today we're going to put this in the cage and get it all set up. So here I have my new G80, but let's have a look at what we're going to be attaching to this. First, we have the cage, memory card, an HDMI cable, the HDMI cable clamp for the cage to go with it, a speed booster, speed booster bracket to go with that. And I just noticed that one of my lights isn't on. Hold on. We have a couple of extra Allen keys because small rig always pack a load into them. I'll talk more about this later, but we have the Panasonic dummy battery because we also have the Desview R5 monitor and we're going to power the camera from the DC output on this into the dummy battery rather than using the built-in internal battery. But before we start doing anything with all this, I still have my old D800 cage that I need to dismantle because I need to cannibalize a couple of bits off this, like the handle and the cold shoe mounts and remove the camera from the cage because my Nikons are going back to stills only duty. So there's my D800 going back to being a regular stills camera again. So I've already set up this camera to match the video settings in this one, which is what I showed in the last video that I'll link up there. Um, now it's basically just a case of getting it into the cage. This is the G80 cage. And one of the things that I really, really like about this is that it has this extra screw right here, which slots in through there. It means I'm going to have to remove this, but that's not a problem. Problems you get with some cages is that the camera can twist a little bit inside the cage. In the Pocket 4K cage, you can see they get around this by having these extra two pins which stick up into the camera body. Those go through there in the cage and then they stick up inside the cage and these mount underneath the camera body to hold it square so that once it's screwed in it doesn't twist and work itself loose. I've got a couple of other cages where the camera has worked themselves loose but small rigs seem to do a really really good job of making sure that that doesn't happen and they've really done that with this. So let's get uh, let's get this strap clip off and uh, and then get this mounted into here just to make it match and because it's going to annoy me if I don't. I'm going to take this one off as well. <laughs> so with those off, we can now pop this in to the back. Actually, we need to take that out first. One of the things I really like about this cage that I like about the Pocket 4K cage and hated about the generic DSLR cage is that you can actually access the battery slot. Great thing about small rig is that they give you Allen keys for everything every time you order something like even just the little hot sh or cold shoe mounts you get another allen key and you, you just kind of build up a little drawer of allen keys and bits but that screws in really far and really well and that is not going anywhere that is not budging it, it's not quite as ergonomic for stills as just holding the camera but that's not a big deal to me because I don't plan to ever use this for stills it will always be for video I like that I can flip the LCD out freely still and it'll rotate you can't really see much from the front because you've you know you've got this bar blocking it you've also got to have your wires coming out but that's not a problem because we'll have the Desview R5 on top we are going to be putting this on which will go that way. You could actually put it in the front or the back. Mm, do I put it in the front or the back? Let's see, I need an Allen key for that. It, it, yeah, it balances quite well because there's a bit more weight at the back. Once the monitor's on, the lens is on, it might be a little bit different, but for now, I'm not too worried. What I am going to do now is I am going to mount the speed booster. And this is the Micro Four Thirds to Nikon F mount one. When this mounts on the bottom, in fact, I'm not even sure if it will 
being in the cage. Yeah, so with with the foot on it, nope, that's the wrong one. With the foot on it, it won't even mount, so I'm gonna have to remove that. I have the small rig one, which this is supposed to work with the Metabone speed boosters, and it's also supposed to work with the Viltrox EF speed booster. Hopefully it'll also work with the F mount speed booster, but we're gonna put this in and then hopefully that bracket will fit just perfectly. And that's not gonna, yeah, that isn't. So I'm gonna have to do without that for now and uh, go find another one, I guess. But right, let's take a look at the Desview R5 monitor. So this is a 5.5 inch 1920 by 1080 IPS monitor with 450 nits of brightness. It's a lot like the Feel World F6 Plus that I've shown on the channel before. It supports 4K HDMI input and it has HDMI pass through to send a signal onto something else. So we'll take it out of the box. We've got the user guide. We have the monitor itself. You can see there we've got HDMI input to come from the camera, HDMI out to go to a transmitter or a recorder or whatever you want. We've got a quarter 20 on the side, a quarter 20 underneath. DC output and headphones underneath and an SD card slot and then DC input. It's powered via either a Sony NPS style battery or a Canon LPE6. It's got a touch screen. It supports 3D LUTs, which is what your SD card slot's for. It's got waveform, vector scope, supports HDR and a whole bunch of other stuff. It comes with the microfiber cleaning cloth. We have a sunshade because it is only 450 nits, but with the sunshade, and especially for most of what I'm gonna be shooting is indoors, so it's not too big of a deal. Uh, we also have a 128 meg SanDisk SD card. I didn't think they even made them this small anymore, but uh, apparently they do. So this is what you would use to copy your LUTs to, to load them onto the screen. We also have, which is very unusual and very nice, a DTAP power supply. So you can go straight from a V-mount battery into here, as long as it's suitable voltage. And we also have a couple of HDMI cables. We have a micro HDMI to HDMI, and we've got mini HDMI to HDMI. We have another Allen key, little mount to attach the monitor on top of the camera. And we also have the frame for the sunshade. I got this cable um, on Amazon, which is the same cable I use on my GX80 rig except this one's a little bit longer. This one's 75 centimeters because they didn't have the 50 centimeter ones. This one might actually be 40 centimeters. What's my tape measure? So this is actually, yeah, this is a 50 centimeter cable and this came with it. So I might actually use this cable rather than the one I just bought. So this is the Desview R5 monitor and this is the bracket that comes with it. On my other one, I've actually got a, a, a Nitsy one that sits on a NATO rail. That's frustrating that this doesn't have holes in it because it means I can only tighten it down so much, which is going to be frustrating. Same with this. I like when these have holes in them because then you can stick the Allen key in and turn them and get really good fitting. Um, but right, we will stick this one on here. Let's see if this one holds. Oh, that holds. That actually holds quite well. Although that is really, really high. On my other one, I've got the Nitsy rail on this part of the handle. So the monitor sits down a lot lower. That's that's kind of high. <laughs> so this is my Nikon 50mm f 1.4D. And on a full frame DSLR like my D800, this is a standard lens or a normal lens. On this, it would normally be about 100 millimeters equivalent. But with the speed booster, it's about a 75 millimeter field of view equivalent to full frame. And there we go. So this stop this all the way down and then we can control the aperture with that. Yeah, this one's long enough. So we'll stick that up and there. I need to swap these around so that the, the larger one is at the back. I love the ones that have two screws because it means that once it's screwed down, it's not gonna randomly untwist on me. So right, we've got the cable plugged in. Where's the cable clamp? squeeze that in and then we'll tighten this down so that's the cable clamp on i cannot plug a usb socket in here but i'm not worried as long as this doesn't come out i can't imagine ever wanting to control this with usb right now i have the uh 
the regular Panasonic battery in, but I'm gonna, well, a third party one, but I'm gonna swap that out with the Panasonic uh, DCC8, which is the Panasonic dummy battery and shove that through the hole. And the only problem with this thing, I really love these little dummy batteries, especially this one. But the problem with it is it, this is a female plug and it's an odd size. It's 4.8 mil outer diameter, 1.7 in. The socket on here is the standard 5.5 by 2.1, which is these. So if I plug that in there and then plug that in there, then I've got power to this. But look at this horrible mess of wires here. This is just a little adapter cable that turns um, 4.8 by 1.7 to 5.5 by 2.1. So what I can do is chop this end off, take this off, splice that onto there, and then I've just got one cable, cover it with some heat shrink, and job done. So let me grab my soldering iron, and we'll do that. go sleeve to sleeve is okay and then we'll go center to center is okay so now I should be able to pop this end of the cable in the DC output underneath here and then the other end in here and that's fine when it's that way around. When I spin it around, it's still long enough to reach okay. And if I put a MPF battery in the back, and we'll turn this on. If I turn the camera on, the little light came on. It's working. It says there's no memory card, but it's working. We have power coming from the monitor on top of the camera. Oh, but hold on a minute. Ooh, okay. <laughs> right, we'll try doing that again because that didn't seal on there very well at all, did it? Let's put the memory card in. ProGrade 128 gig, UHS 2 300 megasecond. Now this is only a UHS 1 camera, so it cannot get anywhere close to the maximum speed of this. However, it means that when I go out and shoot and I fill this full of footage, when I come back home and plug this back into the camera, I can offload that footage really, really quickly. So we're gonna stick that in there. And then we will. So this battery cannot be used. Oh, what? Why can, it's, it's, it's an actual legit Panasonic battery. Why can it not be used? I've been using this thing with a, I mean, look, it's an actual Panasonic DC to DC coupler. I plug it in, I give it the required voltage, and it says it can't be used. And now it's work. No, this battery cannot be used. Why? Oh, well, that sucks. Like, the whole point of this is so that you can just use a normal standard DC source. And <laughs> funnily enough, the third party DC coupler for the GX80 works, but apparently the legit Panasonic one doesn't. So I guess I'm going back to the third party battery, at least for now until I can figure out a cable and a dummy battery that works with the G80, cause this one doesn't. Well, that was pointless doing that cable, wasn't it? Alrighty, so that's basically everything set up. This is, this is my rig now. I need to tighten this, I think, cause the monitors, ooh, wow, that's a scary view, wasn't it? And then there's this, this is the most satisfying part of, of getting anything with a screen. Oh yes. Alrighty, so I have cleaned up my desk a little bit now and I've set something up in front of the camera so we can see the different settings like the focus peaking, the histogram, vector scope, waveforms, whatever. But I need to go get a coffee first and get something to eat because I've had nothing all day and it's getting late and I need to get this video finished off. But I'll be back um, in a couple of seconds for you. Bye. So here you can see we have the monitor up and you can see we have the 
waveform, we have the histogram, and we have the vector scope. Although the vector scope is kind of tiny. Oh no, that's so yeah, it's touchscreen. That's our volume, and that's our brightness. Although it's only 420 nits, so you or 450 nits, so you're probably not going to want to knock that down too dark unless you're actually shooting in a really dark environment it is a 1920 by 1080 display it's 5.5 inches it has hdmi input and hdmi output it has a dc output that apparently doesn't want to power this camera um, because panasonic thinks its own dummy battery is a fake so we'll go through the interface and 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 see what all comes with it so you can see it's very similar to the field world f6 plus that i've shown before big difference is the user interface there's no slidey up menu like there is on the F6 Plus. Instead, you double tap and you get a menu. Oh, no, not that. Why is touch on? <laughs> double tap, we get this menu. And you can see the menu looks very, very different to the one that comes with uh, the Feel World F6 Plus. It's actually really quite nice and it's got all these little bits that, that expand out depending on what it is you want to access. So we'll go to the... Uh, We'll call them in now. These are the shortcuts. So basically, this is what would come off across the bottom. So you can turn your false color for your 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 spectrum or the ARRI uh, false color colors. You can go the zebra and you can set this to whatever level you want, or you can turn it off. Histogram, which is on the side, you can go with the brightness, so you can go full RGB and see them separately, and you can position it wherever you want. But I'm going to turn it off because I don't want the histogram. Focus peaking, you've got green, so you know it'll it'll stand out against like dark areas. You can see there with the log on the back, or we can go with something like blue if we're focusing on something that's yellowy or green, where the focus marks might be a little bit difficult to spot. And you can go red as well, or you can just go with plain white. Uh, you can also go with LUTs, and we don't actually have any installed here, so can't show you that yet, but we will get there. There's also audio meters, so you can see right now that as I'm talking, the microphone built into the camera is picking up my voice and it's sending it out to the HDMI and then the monitor's hearing that and turning that into a VU meter. And it'll go on the left or on the right, but I'm going to turn that off because I don't care about the sound in this because it's all going to be recorded externally. Now we've got all the main menus. So inside Exposure Assist, we've got False Color, which we looked at, Zebra, Histogram, which we've looked at. We've got the Waveform settings here. So you can go either luminance or RGB or turn it off completely. We've got the vector scope, which is just on or off. Now inside the exposure assist, even though we turn everything off, we can also go all wave open. And there you can see we get a really, really big waveform. We get the histogram, we get the vector scope, we get the audio meters, and we get our video in a slightly smaller section of the screen. And from in here, we can actually then go in and turn on where is it focus and composition peaking so you can have all your scopes on along with focus peaking so that you can see everything all at once and instead of having all these little meters on top of your image it just scales down your image to fit your entire view in the shot which is quite handy it will also go hdr so if you're shooting like a really really flat profile you can hit the button depending on what protocol your device uses in order to bring back that contrast and see it properly focus and composition you've got single color so you can view the individual channels with the red the green and the blue or we can go gray and just see the brightness and contrast without being polluted by color information We've got center marker, so we can go on and we can change. Uh, let me move that so that it's somewhere easier to see. So you can see we've got the center marker there. We can go red, green, blue, white, or gray. We have safe areas, so we can set up our title and uh, action safe areas. We can change the color of those as well. Mark ratios, so we can set it to 2.4 to 1 for our nice super wide screen. We can set our transparency so that it's like it's low and we really can't see anything at the top or bottom of the frame, we can set it to high so we see a little bit of what's outside the frame. And then if we're shooting ultra widescreen, I generally tend to have a bit of transparency on the top and the bottom. That way, if something's happening just out of frame, I can see if it's about to creep in and throw off the composition or if I want to knock it down and include it. You've got grid lines as well to help with your composition. So you've got three by three, five by five, six by six, seven, eight, 
and so on. Uh, audio meters, left, right. Uh, LUTs, we will deal with in a minute. We've got display settings. So you can change your aspect ratio here, depending on the signal you're sending in. And this isn't like the other one. This one actually stretches it to fit that ratio. Um, so we don't really want to mess with it, at least not on this, because it's a 16 by nine camera. It puts out a 4K UHD signal. We're at 16 by nine. We've got display flip, so we can flip horizontally, we can flip vertically, depending on how we've got the monitor mounted. We can zoom in to 200% and then drag around the screen and we can pinch to zoom to zoom back out. Pixel to pixel, oh, pixel to pixel is another option where you see it one to one. Um, but it seems to only do it in the center. It doesn't seem to move around. Anamorphic, so you can actually if you're using something like the Siru 35 or 50 mil anamorphic lenses, and this is putting out normal, you can actually tell it to squeeze the image or de-squeeze the image um, on the monitor so you can see your proper anamorphic view. In the system config, you've got your standard color settings, color temperature, so you can adjust the temperature of the screen, um, sound, battery notification, so you can have it to display um, what your battery level is or you can just turn it off completely if you're not worried and then you've got the firmware update and the status of the screen that's basically the run through of the features for this monitor what i am going to do quickly is i have a lot that i have created in um, davinci resolve i'm going to stick it on that little 128 meg memory card so i just put this card in my computer and it looks like there's already a bunch of lots preloaded on it i have copied my own over anyway oh and it goes that way up lots and go open open nope let's go look config custom look look at the sd card oh here we go so here we can see a whole bunch so there's the one i just created this is the one i use in resolve but you can see there's there's some for white balance. Oh, right, so you can shoot one and shift it over. Uh, we've got Cinelite D. Got, oh, day to night. Oh, there's a whole bunch of really cool looks. I'm, I'm gonna have to check these out in DaVinci Resolve. We got Cinelite V ones as well. Uh, we got log conversions for Arri, Black Magic, Canon, probably, oh, DJI, Red, Panasonic, Sony, Technical Cine style for you old school Canon people, Natural looks, we've got Portrait looks, we've got Vlog L looks, and there's the Panasonic one that I usually use. And then we can see it's loading it in from the SD card into the monitor. I don't know how many this can store, but uh, I will pop an overlay on the screen to tell you when I've looked it up. So now we've escaped the card. It's going back to the HDMI signal. And now if I go into the LUTs, I should be able to... Oh, that didn't work quite the way I expected it to. There's something wrong with that look. Okay, I'm going to have to have a look and try and figure out the format of these LUTs because obviously I've exported one out from... Uh, DaVinci Resolve that the monitor doesn't understand. I don't know. I'm going to have to look up how to change the look on this thing because right now it only seems to want to use that horrible failed Panasonic one that I'm going to have to try and figure out how to export and also try and figure out uh, why I can't change this to another look. But anyway, yeah, that's the Desview R5. I'm definitely going to have to change this bracket because it's already fallen off once while I've shot this video. So it's not very secure and safe. Um, it feels, see, if I do that, you see how it slides off even though it's supposed to be tightened down. That is as tightened down as I can get it. But if I do this, it just slides off. If you get this monitor, it comes with this bracket. Don't use it. Just just don't use it because it's not worth it. Your monitors, you know, if you're moving around, eventually your monitor's just going to come flying off, hit the ground. It's probably going to tear the cable out. So don't use this. This is John from the future. I'm currently editing this video. I have actually figured out a solution to this for now until I can get a better monitor mount. I've put one of the small rig cold shoes on the front of the handle and slid the monitor mount into that. That way, even if it does work loose, gravity's working in my favor and it's just holding it in the shoe. So this is an option. If you can mount it this way, then this mount isn't so bad. The monitor itself, is uh is pretty cool if you can figure out that LUT issue and i need to figure out why it can't power the camera i'll figure that out another time 
I'm sure there will be a perfectly logical explanation. But that's going to be it for now. We will close this. Let me point this back over there so you've got a prettier view to look at. There you go. Today's good mood is sponsored by coffee. That's it for now. If you like this video, don't forget to subscribe and give it a thumbs up if you want to see more. I don't know what I'm going to do next. Oh, yes, I do. Yes, I do. It's a surprise. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.